Hello, my name is Gregor McDonald, and today's presentation is titled Coal World. In this presentation, I'll be asking the following question. Will our current energy transition deliver us to a world of renewable green energy or return us back to a world of coal? Today, I will suggest that the risk of a return to coal is much higher than most anticipate. First, let's look at the central driver behind our current energy transition. This is a chart of non-OPEC crude oil supply. You can see we're currently running around 41.5 million barrels a day, down from the 2004 high of about 42.5 million barrels a day. Now, non-OPEC crude oil supply generally accounts for around 60% of the total supply of global oil. This majority portion of the world's oil supply is in decline, and it's not an anomalous short-term decline. It's a decline that's taken place over five to six years. It's a decline that's taken place in uh, the background against rising prices, and it's a decline that's resulted in loss of a million barrels per day. And my question is, how can the world increase oil production with 60% of total supply in decline? And so here we are in energy transition, and the world is now forced to consider energy solutions to supplant the decline of oil. We're asking ourselves, you know, where do we go next? Well, there's natural gas, but can we really scale up natural gas production from shale? to enable energy transition. There's wind, but wind has an intermittency issue. I mean, how much can our power grid rely on a fluctuating source of power? There's solar, but the amount of solar we'd have to build is quite daunting. And then, of course, there's nuclear, but nuclear has quite a long build-out cycle. Now, a lot of people currently looking at energy transition will cite the great historical infrastructure programs as examples of our capability to conduct successful energy transition. These transitionists will point to the retooling of Detroit to build arms for World War II, or the space program as examples of what we can do if we really put our minds to the problem. But these big project infrastructure programs are actually just one part of energy transition. Other transitionists will cite the technical feasibility of running the world on new energy sources once we've actually built the new energy capacity. For example, they'll say a certain portion of the desert in North Africa built out with solar could power all of Europe. Of course, after you've run a, a cable across the Mediterranean. On a smaller level, they'll say, look, if we build enough wind power, we can run a whole country like Spain. And you can see the Spanish bull there looking over the Spanish wind tower. I guess he's very bullish on Spanish wind. What we don't see often enough, however, is a holistic model that looks at the entirety of energy transition. You know, this is the build-out and the manufacturing of new infrastructure, and then it's the deployment of new power generation and a power grid 2.0. And of course, it's the energy required to fund the build-out. Now, for example, at one of MIT's solar groups, and this is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, They've estimated that to switch the United States away from oil and then, to let, and then to then electrify most of the transport system and run that system on solar power, you would need, first, manufacturing floor space the size of the state of Rhode Island to manufacture solar. You would then need a 20-year rolling build-out of solar power, feeding it into the grid, and then, of course, you would need oil. Because in this first part of this transition, 
you'll not be able to build solar using solar. You will still need oil. Well, let's consider a previous energy transition when Europe moved from wood to coal. Now, this is a chart from Professor Robert Allen at Oxford, and it shows the prices of wood and coal in terms of grams of silver per million BTUs. Now, there's a lot of things I could say about this chart and this period of human history, but let me just focus in on a couple of key things. First, even though coal was cheaper than wood, the English stuck with wood for quite some time for a number of reasons, but largely because their existing system was already running on wood. Second, it wasn't until the spread between the price of wood and the price of coal got very wide that England finally started to transition to coal. And finally, we need to be aware that when England and Europe transitioned from wood to coal, they were lucky to be switching from lower power density wood to higher power density coal. And that's the other important factor in our current energy transition. You see, in previous energy transitions from wood to coal and then coal to oil, humanity enjoyed the massive productivity gain of going to higher density energy sources. Now, this is an example of unsuccessful energy transition. This is Easter Island. You know, this is what happens when your economy is based on wood and there's not another energy source to transition to. So, you know, when the English transitioned from wood to coal, they were lucky to have actually had some coal. But the Easter Islanders used up all their wood, denuded their entire island of forest, and then died out. And some have suggested that something similar might have happened had the English not been endowed with coal. <laughs> 